Responses. Okay, responses is really cool. Um, turn to someone and give them a compliment. Turn to someone and give them a compliment. <laughs> You got a compliment, okay? <laughs> now, responsiveness. Oh, you seem to like doing that. We could do more on that. I'm well, no, actually almost finished, so it's cool. Um, we can do, uh, so how was that to give a compliment? Does that feel nice? A little pat in the back? Now, I got a question for you. I want to take it to another level. Can you give a compliment and not really mean it? Not, yes. Can you apologize and not really mean it? If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know? Say sorry to your brother. I'm sorry. So, I'm so sorry. No, no. Mean it. I'm sorry you're my brother. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry you're my brother. So really mean it. So the response to this talks about uh, this whole notion of how we see people. Because on one surface level, and I used to do a lot of training on communication skills and around assertiveness training and how to talk to people and do the pop, pop of body language, you nod with them, eye contact. I'm sure you're taking these classes and, you know, arm gestures and, you know, mimicking them or just sort of mirroring what they're doing. And all this stuff is really good behaviors to have. And you can do that in your, with your counseling, with your session. But what if you don't, don't actually like the person? You go through all the motions. You do all the right things, right? Other that to the text, but you don't really like them. Do you think, do you think they can tell? Yeah. So there's something different. There, up, up, upstairs, there's something we call behavior. It's what we see in the surface all the time. We see people's behaviors, right? But there's something underneath that. And it's called a way of being. It's the essence of who the people are. And they might say the right things, but it just doesn't quite, I use the phrase, it doesn't, not, it doesn't quite compute. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't quite jigger. Or you get a spider sense. That's another phrase that's used. You get a spider sense that something doesn't line up. What they're saying and doing is not really working with who they are, what, what's, what, what they're really picking up on. So there's a little something different, and it's, it's called um, the way of being. It's something that's a little deeper into the person's uh, being, if you will, the way of being. And in the work that I, that I studied and I'm, I'm teaching these days, called, it's from the organization called Arbinger, and there's some links on the website to look at some of that stuff. But it talks about two ways of being. That there's a responsive way of being, which is seeing people as people, like just like you and I are, are as one, if you will, not, not, not the same person, but certainly unique in our own right and, and deserve to be unique. And that, that your hopes and dreams are, are similar to mine. I have hopes and dreams as well. So we share that common, common um, humanity, if you will. So the response in this piece is seeing people as people. And when you see people as people, you're, you're, you're at peace. The, 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 your heart's at peace. But there's another way of seeing people. And it's about being resistant to people. That your uh, connection to a person or your way of being to another person is not seeing them as a person, but rather seeing them as an object. And so you're resistant to their, their, to, their, uh, to their experience in life. They're resistant to who they are. And there's actually three ways that you can be resistant if you want to take some notes on this. To, you can treat people as an object and be obje objectifying, but you can treat them in three ways. They can be an obstacle to you. Once you get into that resistance of the zone, when you get those little feelers out, they can be an obstacle to you, which means they get in your face, they get in your way, they're, they're, they're blocking you to, get it, uh, to getting something. They can be a vehicle, something that you can use to get your way, someone that you, can, you have to overcome or, or, or make, make use of, to, if you will, to get your objectives and goals made. Or they can be irrelevant to you. That can be a non person non grata, a person that's not really very important at all. Now, when you think about that, when you treat a person as an obstacle, and well, no, no, you can treat them any way you want behaviorally, but when they sense, well, let me ask you this: if you treat a person as an obstacle, as a vehicle, or as a or as irrelevant, do you think they can sense it? Yes. Think, do you think they know somewhere inside? Now, it might not be very obvious, but be very subtle. But do you think they kind of know? Let me give you an example that kind of brought it home for me. I was uh, having a dinner party with my wife, and this is before we had the baby, and uh, we were having a dinner party, and we had to um, put together a punch, and we realized we had no soda. 
be able to make an up a big fruit punch soda thing. And so my, it was like quarter to seven, and I, the guests were coming for dinner at seven. And the wife said, "Get down to the store as fast as you can, grab some soda." So I hopped in the car and popped down the store, went to the back of the line, and uh, there was I grabbed a couple of uh, jugs of soda, and I came out, and there was like one lineup, and there's like seven people in it, and I'm standing there going. Watch. And then one of the uh, one of the checkout gals comes over and puts the key in the cash register and puts on the little light, the, you know, aisle you know, number three or whatever, right? And she looks around the cash register and said, "I'll help the next person in line." <laughs> I was out of there in a flash. Now, how did I see those folks in front of me? There are obstacles to me. They're in my way. They're blocking my progress, my goals, my desires, my dreams. How do you think I treated the cashier? Hurry up. Yeah, in this language would be a vehicle. She, I was using her. I was, the faster she went, the better she was to me. I didn't, I didn't ask her how she's doing or what was going on. I just, I was at the gravity, gone. So I, so I, so that in the there's a lot of resistance, a lot of tension in that situation, obstacle and vehicle involved in that. Now a week later, my wife and I have a little movie night. We rent, we have these movies that we rent, and we have, uh, we both have uh, milk allergy, so we get the soy-based ice cream, and there's one called with peanut butter and chocolate. <gasps> they never good. And my, we were out, so my wife said, "Grab, go down to the store." I was, good. I was, I'm not doing the errands there. Right. Go down to the store, get some ice cream. She didn't quite say it like that, but whatever. And grab some ice cream. So I go down to the store, and the, the same, same grocery store, and I go back and grab the ice cream out of the bins. It's in the health food section. It's back in the store. So I got the little ice cream here, and I'm, I'm out. And this time, the checkout line's got like three people lying, two people lying, four people lying, three people lying, two people lying. It's so, well, two of them go, 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 two people lying. And as luck would happen, the two people lying person was actually the person in the head was just paying out, so they're gone. But there's a lady with a huge cart. And she looked at me, and she said, oh, dear. If you have to wait for me, your ice cream's going to be on the floor. Why don't you go ahead of me? How'd you see me? No. Someone in need. Did you see me as an object or a person? A person. She saw me as a person. She saw my, my hopes and dreams and my, my, uh, my desires and my challenges and probably related to me. So she saw me as a person. So this, this is very subtle stuff every day, folks, but you have to ask the question, where does peace begin and where does war begin? Where does it begin? Yeah, with our thoughts and ideas around people, whether we see them as people or not. You know, when you look at global wars, they're objects. You know, in, in, historically they were objects. We even gave them nicknames, like slang names, right? For, for the people that were on the other side. We, 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 we dehumanized them, made them objects as much as possible. So I tell you that because one of the things that you'll find, and I'm sure you find this already, is that when people come to your organization, or when you're in your organization, and you feel and you sense that the people that you're working with, their way of being, is resistance to you, it's not very inviting to engage, is it? In fact, you want to just get the heck out of there, or just put up your time, or be 70% engaged and a little, little disenchanted, or be disengaged entirely, or just be enrolled, just do your job, Put up with that person that treats you like an object or vehicle or, or irrelevant and just go home and do your thing. So there's a sacrifice that's being made there when, when, in, in a workplace that is not responsive, in a culture where people are together. And you know what the funny thing is with all that? I don't know if you found this, but when you have a culture that's engaged in disengaging, when you have a culture that's engaged in resistance, which you can actually have a culture that's engaged, but it's engaged in resistance, the collusions start. Collusions start when people get on each other's side. And this little click over here is against that little click over there, and there's a little lunchroom monitor talk and all this kind of stuff. And you get this terribly implosive stuff happening in your work culture. Terribly implosive stuff. And so engagement is, is just disintegrated because everybody's out for themselves. It's actually what I call the culture of entitlement, not the culture of human potential. The culture of entitlement is just the disengaged, resistant, uh, backstabbing, collusion kind of thing where you get people on your side to, win, to make your point. All of it, by the way, is just a way of being, which can be changed into another way of being. So let me give you one more story to go with this, and we'll do a closing activity, and we'll be out five minutes early. Um, you're probably saying, well, okay, well, I got this person that I'm really resistant to. I can't stand. They drive me nuts. They're the, my difficult person. Everybody has my difficult person. You got your difficult person? My difficult person. You got that person? Okay. And here's a quote to go, to go with this. Difficult people, if you want to write this down, difficult people are not failed attempts 
Difficult people have not failed attempts at being me. They are unique expressions of the human spirit. Difficult people have not failed attempts at being me. They, they are unique expressions of the human spirit and deserve to be loved. So there's books and stuff on this. There's workshops and books on this. And there's some stuff you can go to my website and download and, and check it out for sure. But I want to tell you one story because the key to being uh, to uh, going from resistance to someone to back to response to someone is a way of being. That's the key. So how do you change your way of being? Sometimes it can change with a thought. I want to tell you a story that illustrates the point. I have the great blessing of being in, 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 in the. Uh, I, I have the great blessing of being able to travel internationally with the work that I do. I've been to Northern Ireland, California, across Canada, the whole show, all these talks I do with folks like yourselves, the unsung heroes, big hearted people like yourselves. And um, I love traveling. I just I thoroughly enjoy traveling. I love the free movies on the airplane. You know, I love the departure level, uh, the arrivals level, all the humanity coming together and going, you know, saying goodbye to kids and saying hello to kids. And you know, just the, the confluence of humanity at airports really intrigues me. But there's one place that drives me a bit nuts. It's called the security check-in. <laughs> and I don't know if you ever noticed, but whenever you're in a hurry to get to an appointment, you catch all the red lights. Well, I was on my way back from Ireland. I was in Belfast, Northern Ireland, doing some work with the troubles over there. And I was running late because I had some troubles with my, uh, my rental car. So I was running late to get to the airport. So I was pushing, I'm pushing the boundaries. And this, uh, I got the, uh, the security checkpoint gal of uh, all security checkpoint gals, the cold molasses gal. You know, the one at the, the, the grocery store that moves like cold molasses and you're in a big hurry? And they're just saying, that, you get everything you want, dear? You know, really so. Well, she was the slowest cold molasses. Of course, I'm in a big rush, so she's starting to drive me nuts immediately. So she, it's an island, so, she's, so she says, uh, can I have your boarding pass, please? So I give her my boarding pass, and she, you know, the old the bag goes slide through the, through the extra machine. And you know how it sort of goes through, and you just ho hope it keeps on going? Well, it went out, and then went <laughs> back in again. And, oh, boy. And then I heard the five words that no one in a hurry ever wants to hear. Is this your bag, sir? <laughs> I was like, no, I've never seen that bag before. <laughs> well, of course, I couldn't have all my goodies in it. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, so she checked the bag. So she zips the thing up, she puts some rubber gloves, and she's checking the bag so, so slow. And um, if, if you could see me, I'd be going, would you please hurry up? But of course you can't do that, because if you do, they will slow down. So I'm standing there with a big fake smile on my face going, oh my god, this guy's going to drive me nuts. Check my talk, he's going to be late. And I, I actually had a conference the next day. There's only one flight from Heathrow to Halifax. I had a conference the next day. It was my wife's association. So not only would I miss a conference, I'd be sleeping on the couch for a week. <laughs> so the stakes were high, folks. The stakes were high. So I thought, this is driving me nuts. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be cool and not, not be too expressive. But don't I get the, what's called a full meal deal at the security checkpoint? It's a, the sniff test. You know that little machine that sniffs things? So she changed her gloves as, 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 as if she's going to a ball. She changes her rubber gloves. <laughs> Opens the thing and wipes the thing. He puts puts the machine like this fast and puts it in the thing and stands back and is waiting for the machine to, to click its little beepy sound or whatever it does, right? But this time I'm over the roof. But I notice something out of the corner of my eye on her uniform. I notice a little lapel pin, and it's pink. It's a little ribbon. And in the time it took me to, to for the machine to click. I went through a whole bunch of different thoughts. One of them was, I wonder if she has breast cancer. I wonder if her parents or mom or sister or daughter has breast cancer. I thought, well, my friend Karen has breast cancer. And all of a sudden, that resistance, well, you can tell which kind of person she was from, right? She was an obstacle, right? That obstacle energy went blah, 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 blah. And I saw her as a person. I found her humanity. And all it took was just a little pin. And it, as long as it took me to tell you the story, that's a, that's a, I, I went from a heart of war to heart of peace. A person is person, from resistance to person, resistance to person is person. And she gave me back my boarding pass. I looked her in the eye and I said, ma'am, I want to thank you for the diligence for the way you so carefully checked our bags so we could fly safely in the skies today. And she, she goes, why? We don't get many people saying that. <laughs> Now, if that was five minutes earlier, I would say, I bet you don't, lady. <laughs> but at that moment, that's, I call it a sacred moment. At that sacred moment, there was a woman who experienced something that I knew about. 
and I saw her humanity, and my most difficult person on the planet that day was suddenly uh, someone that I could appreciate. Because the truth is, folks, there's not one terrorist on the planet that's going to get past your screening. That's the truth. Now, beyond my stuff, beyond my 10%, 90% processing the information, that the truth is that there's no one going to get through a screening. I made my flight, I got home, did the conference, and now I have a story to tell about being, not, not just being a teacher of this stuff, being failable with this stuff too. So don't be too hard on yourself because everybody has a chance. But your homework is, is to find out that little piece of humanity for the person that drives you nuts.